Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from around the world. Thank you for joining us and uh, and happy new year. This is, welcome to the latest in our Innovation at Work webinar series from MIT uh, Sloan Executive, Executive Education. You know, uh, normally, those of you that are familiar with this uh, webinar series know that uh, we usually interview members of our faculty about their work uh, and how that relates to uh, our programs in executive education and uh, things that all of you uh, can do with those uh, insights. Uh, today, we're going to uh, try something new, which we're very excited about. Uh, and, and that is to, uh, it, we've invited some uh, past participants and indeed uh, current participants uh, from our executive education uh, customer base uh, to come and share some of their experiences, not only in our programs, uh, but really uh, in their work, uh, in their lives, uh, and, and how they're uh, thinking about uh, the future uh, and how they base that in some things, some key lessons that they've learned uh, over the past uh, several several months uh, and more. And just to give a little uh, context for that, uh, I, I quite like this uh, model, which I uh, sometimes talk about, uh, of thinking about the gradient uh, of change that we see in the world. You know, historically, many changes came uh, really like step functions. You know, uh, there'd be a major change, a uh, new technology, uh, something that would uh, offer a really significant performance improvement uh, to a business or to an organization. Uh, and you know, perhaps you didn't have to be the early adopter. You know, these are step function changes. So there was a little bit of time uh, for, uh, for people to uh, make those investments uh, and catch up. But as time has gone on, uh, these uh, innovations and changes are coming thicker and faster. Uh, and, and what that really means is uh, it's no longer a series of steps that you can climb and perhaps take your time. We're really looking at a graph uh, that is an upward uh, curve of ever increasing gradient. Uh, and what that means is uh, if you don't stay on that curve, you're going to be falling behind it uh, ever more quickly. And so the challenge uh, that we all face is how do we stay on that curve? Uh, or even more significantly, if you really want to be an innovator, how do you get ahead of that curve? Uh, and, and that's what I'm hoping to be able to talk uh, with our three participants uh, about in today's conversation. So um, Susan Sly, uh, Ram Srinivasan, uh, and uh, Fuad Daghar, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for joining us. You know, we have uh, represented in you really a, a kind of a diverse uh, range of industries uh, and experiences. Uh, and uh, what I will do is uh, just ask a few questions to, uh, to, to, to get each of you uh, going a little bit on, on this topic. Uh, but as you all know uh, who are watching today, we always mean these to be very interactive. Uh, so please do feel free uh, as we go along to uh, add comments uh, in, in, in the chat uh, or ask questions in the Q&A tab as Lauren described. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, try to get those to our panelists uh, and, and have a great conversation over the next hour. So first of all, uh, I'd like to turn uh, to, to you, Susan, and just a little bit of background. Su Susan Sly is uh, really a, a very accomplished professional speaker and trainer and coach uh, and author, uh, and also an entrepreneur in her own right. So you know, she really uh, knows what she's talking about when she's helping people as a coach. Uh, and as a speaker, as, as an expert. Uh, she's currently CEO uh, of uh, Radius uh, AI, uh, which uh, I hope we'll learn a little bit about uh, in, in, in this conversation. Uh, but Susan, you know, when you and I were, uh, were talking in preparation uh, for, for today's event, uh, I asked you, you know, what are some of the things that uh, you've particularly uh, learned uh, in the last uh, sort of year, 18 months, uh, what are one or two of the major challenges that, that, that you've seen and how have those, uh, how have those helped you uh, and how can you think that that could help others who are, uh, who are watching today? Thank you, Peter. What a great question. It's a, a deep honor to be here with Ram and Fuad and I want to acknowledge everyone for being here and, and the biggest thing with any type of webinar is that the objective is always to take away one, two or three things that are tangible and usable in your endeavors. And um, I also, Peter, want to say a special hello to my dad. Um, my dad is here. You can all say hello to him in the chat. His name is Joe Lore, and uh, he was an 
engineer and that's where I got my wacky brain. So thanks dad for that. The, the first thing I wanna talk about in terms of the terrain we're in, when I was 10 years old, Peter, my dad gave me a copy of Sun Tzu, The Art of War. And um, other kids read Charlotte's Web, but that's what he gave to me. And, uh, and he said, Susan, if you, if you really appreciate this book and its teachings, it will help you understand life and business. And one of the key things that I've taken over the last 40 years from that book is that we must adapt to our terrain. The terrain is going to change. Let's face it. The pandemic wasn't the first pandemic. The last recession wasn't the last recession. Uh, it, look at the markets today, all of the things that are happening. So in, in my humble opinion, as CEOs, as entrepreneurs, as leaders in our industries, we must be adaptable. Adaptability comes through challenge, and that doesn't come at an age. There are many 20-year-olds I meet who have been through a host of challenges. I see we have people here from Africa. I've been to Africa many times. Um, there are a lot of 20-year-olds I've met in Africa and countries like Malawi and Ethiopia that have a lifetime of experience at 20 years old. So that, that has nothing to do with an age on our driver's license. But the question was, what are some of the challenges that we faced as a company and how did we adapt to them? So the first one, let's get very honest and talk about the pandemic. So our company, Radius AI, we specialize in advanced analytics at the edge. And so we have a, the ability to use existing security cameras and turn a 2D world into a 3D world. And that may sound all very elegant. This is coming from a woman who failed her first year of calculus and that's why I'm here at MIT, because when I became the co-founder and co-CEO of this company, I had to learn AI really fast. I haven't written a line of code since 92. I mean, oh my gosh, right? So the in looking at what it is we were doing, we were very focused in the retail sector. And initially our value proposition was saying, hey, what we are gonna do is present real time offers to people when they're at the gas pump. And then, you know, the pandemic hits, we begin to pivot and we realize there is a bigger appetite for our analytics to improve human performance. And we have always been a human-centric AI company. So I prepared three tips for all of you. Um, some of you might say it's worth the price of admission, they're rubbish. Some of you might go, oh, these are pretty good. So whatever it is for you, hopefully you leave here with something tangible. So the first tip I wanna give is this. Always pay attention to your end user and your end user isn't necessarily the person writing the check for your product. So at Radius, we spend, my co-CEO, Aikut Dengi and I, we spend a lot of time with the end users and we do forms with them. We make sure their supervisors aren't in the room. We ask for the raw and real feedback so that as we're evolving our product, that we're making sure the people who are ultimately going to use it are going to be the ones who want to use it. The second thing is do not ignore the masses. Let's take a look at meme stocks, cryptocurrency, how masses of people are driving companies to innovate. When the head of AMC says, we are going to take Shiba Inu, I mean, seriously, when Elon Musk says we're going to take Dogecoin or Mark Cuban or whoever it is, it's because the masses are driving this trend. And it's a trend that isn't going to go away. So I was speaking to one of our, our key customers yesterday, and he said, Susan, do you know anyone who really understands the metaverse? And I said, actually, I, I do. And he said, you know, we're really starting to think about that. Who was talking about the metaverse last year, except maybe groups of people at MIT? talking about the metaverse, who was really, really talking about NFTs. But these trends, you can't ignore them. Companies like Kodak and Blockbuster ignored trends. Kodak made a critical mistake. They thought that digital photography was a noun, not a verb. And they ignored early platforms. The third thing I want to say is in the face of challenge, you can give up or get better. There are massive companies that started during the last recession. You know, Instagram is a great example. So here we are, you know, still in a pandemic. I'm leaving for New York soon for um, a huge conference and, and we're in the throes of it. I predict, Peter, that 
the following will happen. Some of the greatest companies, the household name companies are just getting started right now. And companies like the companies you'll hear about from my colleagues in just a moment, they're the ones who are digging in, they're innovating, they're adapting, they're taking a look at what people truly want. And they're the companies that are going to go on the trajectory. So I just wanted to hopefully, you know, and if anyone has questions about that, please put it in the chat. But, um, you know, I think this is one of the most exciting times to be an entrepreneur. I really, really do. And I, I'm excited in terms of what's happening with technology so great question thank you uh, and it, thank you it, it sounds like you're uh, you're talking at the end there very much about an idea of, of, of agility uh, mm -hmm. so, so how how do you remain uh, agile what's your approach what works for you it's really the student mind um you know, there's a Wayne Dyer, for those of you who read personal development, Wayne was a friend of mine. And I'll never forget, I was in Maui. And I was in the airport and he called me. And he said, Susan, do you know what ego stands for? And I said, what? And he said, it stands for edging God out. Whatever you choose to believe, believe or not believe. As leaders in our industries, we can't have an ego. So we must approach everything with a student mind, with a customer mind. We've seen great companies implode because the person at the helm was egomaniacal. And even, you know, if, you know, Steve Jobs, I recommend if you haven't read the book on Steve Jobs, please do, that Steve gets ousted from Apple because a lot of people said, hey, his ego was so big, but he he left, he did Pixar, he got a little more humble, he started to think differently, and then came back and really took Apple to the next level. I do not personally believe had he stayed at Apple that Apple would be the company it is today. So approach things with the student mind, how I stay agile, I, I, a, a little thing I will say, it has nothing to do with imposter syndrome, which is really real for women in tech especially, but, I approach every meeting that I have to earn the right to be there and I'm not the smartest person in the room. And when I do that, that means I come in with a student mind. And as soon as I'm done speaking, I'm going to be taking notes from Fouad and Rom because I'm here to learn from them. And so that's how we stay agile. And I, I, I pray to God, Peter, that I remain that day until I take my very last breath and I go, oh my gosh, that was amazing. Right? <laughs> That's, that, that's great. And of, of, of course, sitting in an academic institution, uh, I, I love the metaphor that, that you're using uh, for, for this uh, as well. So you touched on this uh, in, in your opening remarks, but you know, as, as you are looking at the near and not so near future, uh, you know, where are you seeing uh, opportunities? Uh, how can people really do what you uh, were, were recommending uh, and make something great out of uh, the, 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 the sort of the crisis, if you like, that has been slowly unfolding over the, the past 18 months or so? Well, the opportunities, um, th there, are, there are many out there. And um, I think that there are a lot of great companies, and we've had this discussion in classes at MIT, there are a lot of great companies that um, never become great companies because there is a great product, but there's no one who knows how to sell it or there's a great product, but it's before it's time. Where I see opportunities now are in the following areas. Um, one, definitely healthcare and gerontology in the United States. We have over 10,000 people every single day who are turning 65. Um, at, you know, at Radius, again, going back to the fact that we focus on human-centric AI in the retail sector, um, I believe that this is a bold prediction, and I may end up looking, you know, to use a British term since I'm a Commonwealth there, like a complete git after saying this. I'm not afraid to make fun of myself anyway. <laughs> but the um, I predict that as much as technology is advancing, and right now we have the great resignation with 73% of Americans wanting to leave their jobs. We have a, a, a massive number of people who, who work at minimum wage jobs who really are saying, hey, 
I, I don't feel comfortable being on the front line as a cashier, you know, as a ski lift operator or whatever it is they're doing. Um, I think that that is going to boldly push technology to um, start to think about how it can replace those jobs. At Radius, we're doing something very different. We're looking at ways to use technology to actually enhance those jobs so that the people who do want to be there can do their job with more efficiency, that they can be happier about it, they can feel better about it, feel more productive. And our, our tagline for our, our new product we're launching in Q2 is that we make every employee a superstar. So I think there's going to be a pushback for human-centric AI. And then I want to talk about VR and AR. AR is, is a while off yet but virtual reality is here. And it's interesting because there's been a lot of different dialogue around the metaverse, but going back to what I said regarding the masses, where did the metaverse come out of? The metaverse came out of the gamers. So I don't know how many of you are perhaps similar in age to me, but in the eighties we had Pac-Man. And I remember going to my dad and saying, oh dad, I really wanna have a video game. And my father in his infinite wisdom said, code one yourself, I'm not giving you one. So I. I, that's when I started coding. But thinking about that, the gaming industry evolved. And then suddenly, you know, even my godson, he's 20 years old. He has a whole host of NFTs that he gained over the years gaming. And now we're suddenly talking about NFTs, Martha Stewart, Snoop Dogg, all of these people are selling NFTs. Now my friend texted me yesterday. He's like, I'm getting into MI NFTs. Like, okay. So this is not a trend and businesses that choose to ignore this evolution of a metaverse, you can call it web three, you can call it whatever you want. Don't forget who it's being driven by. And if you're the person perhaps, and I say this with such respect, who sat back and said, the Reddit groups aren't going to do anything, look what they did. And it's the same group of people, this next generation of Gen Z, Gen Z, whatever you wanna call it, that is going to drive this push for VR to become AR. So there are definite trends. Um, and even you know, as a tech investor, these are the things I look at with companies. And even you know, when we're hiring people at Radius and um, hey, if you know any great data scientists and engineers, send them my way on LinkedIn. Um, you know, even as we're hiring people at Radius, we're looking for people who have this long-term vision in terms of what's coming as opposed to sitting back and being cynical. Because here's the, the thing I will finish with is, um, skepticism is never going to make you more money. That's a great point. So you, you've got to be in the game to win the game. Uh, yeah, and, exactly. And trying many things, uh, which I like as well. Uh, before I move on to 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 uh, introduce Ram, what, one thing occurred to me while you were uh, describing the idea of human centric uh, AI, uh, and that conjures uh, various thoughts for me. This human centric from the kind of the user and the experience point of view. But there's also the question of human centric from the point of view of really being a human centric organization and being a human centric society. Mm. You know, there are a lot of concerns that people are expressing about uh, about AI uh, at the moment in terms of what its impact might be uh, on employment or what its impact might be uh, on you know, policy and decision making uh, or other kinds of unintended consequences of handing over uh, the keys to the car, literally, uh, yeah, to, yeah. To, to the AI. Uh, as a leader in this space, you know, how do you think about uh, those challenges? And what do you see your responsibility is, uh, and, and all of our responsibilities are, to ensure that we get the positive outcomes and not some of these negative externalities? I feel like, wow, that's a that's a huge question. And um, I have to fly to, to Massachusetts and we'll put a bunch of people in a room with Mike's pastries and we'll have that conversation. The, <laughs> There's, there's a couple of things that goes back to the black box. So, um, you know, for those of you not overly familiar with AI and what we're seeing with um, a lot of the social media companies right now is when one is creating artificial intelligence, there are inputs that it is giving the AI, and then the AI takes those inputs and gives outputs. Unfortunately, what is happening sometimes is that inputs are yielding unexpected outputs and they can't always figure out how the AI got the outputs in that 
becomes the black box. That's where the problem is. So just like not all restaurants are created equal, not all AI is created equal. So I have a fundamental, um, perhaps it's Pollyanna-ish, and I like to be an optimist, um, which is like a training a muscle. Really, it is. It's, it's very easy to wake up and be that skeptical, you know, negative person. But I feel it comes down to this. Good people create good technology and bad people create bad technology, right? What is the intent of the technology? So if we look at the McKinsey study on AI um, that came out, I think, two years ago, essentially saying that by the year 2030, 800 million jobs were going to be displaced, not misplaced, displaced with AI and machine learning. And so one of the things right now, as of today, there is a 10,000 person deficit in data scientists in the United States. And so understanding it's not job replacement, it's job displacement. If I have five children, if you're not teaching your children to embrace technology, you're setting them up for a future that doesn't exist. Peter, when we're talking about things like artificial intelligence, AR, VR, autonomous vehicles, space exploration, the metaverse, those are things that are inevitable. It goes back to adapt to your terrain. If something is inevitable, you have the opportunity to capitalize on it, embrace it, and if you're a good person, do good things with it. But if you choose to sit back and, and pretend that these things aren't inevitable, you're, you're sorely mistaken. I really feel there are there are countries, there are the EU has a governance board for AI. What I think in the perfect ideal world we would have is that we would have an AI governance board that would be much like, say, the Federal Reserve that would be non-affiliated, and they would appoint people from the following areas, not just data science, not just engineering, but people who specialize in, in human empowerment, you know, and as crazy as some of you might think, I've done speaking events with him, people like Tony Robbins, people who understand psychology, and putting together this board of governance and holding companies to a high standard is ultimately what is going to rule the day. And I want to disclaim this and say that the as we go into the future and we have a very, you know, real possibility that the wars of the future will be fought with AI, I think at the end of the day, if you have a company that has artificial intelligence, you are ultimately responsible for the livelihood of the next generations and take that responsibility very seriously. Thank you. That's uh, you know, that, that's a very uh, thought-provoking uh, kind of answer to the question. So thank you. And also, it really brings us into the realm of thinking about people. And with that, I'd like to uh, bring Ram uh, on, onto the stage, Ram Srinivasan, who's the Managing Director of Consulting uh, at JLL, uh, which uh, I think uh, people outside the US might not know, but I'll ask Ram maybe just to talk a little bit about uh, his work, but he's essentially in the real estate sector, uh, but uh, very involved in thinking about workplace strategy, uh, transformation, workforce planning, uh, as well as using a lot of uh, very high tech tools uh, to uh, help his clients uh, to make the most out of their portfolios. Uh, and so, uh, Ram, maybe I could start, though, just by asking you uh, the, the same uh, question, which, you know, what, what are one or two of the things that, uh, that stand out for you uh, that have been challenges that you've learned over the last year or two? Uh, and, and how do you see those uh, helping, helping you and helping all of us uh, as we go into the future? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I, I echo so much of what Susan said. And I'm sure what you will hear from Parth as well, we've had some uh, incredible mix of individuals come together, a uh, number of the programs that I attended at MIT, uh, just the diversity of the cohort, the, the incredible insight that they bring, the experience that they bring, it's been such an amazing learning experience. And that one word, learning, comes with the implicit assumption of humility. And I would say that uh, that is my one big takeaway over the last 24 odd months. Humility actually begins with three simple words. Uh, the three simple words that I don't know. And at this point of time, there is so much complexity that if we do not approach problems with humility, we stand to potentially fail the test that those problems pose. So I don't know is an incredible state of mind to be in. And it opens us to learning. And Susan kind of uh, 
spoke about uh, learning significantly through her through her remarks as well so i'm incredibly thankful for all of the individuals that participated through some of the courses that i, did. I attended at mit equally the educators and professors and all of the support staff at mit so very very grateful for everything that i learned uh, what i would also say is that uh, we have over the last 18 24 odd months each one of us has dealt with the complexity ambiguity uh, paradox opportunity challenge these are extraordinary times and we should pat ourselves on the back we are extraordinary people living in extraordinary times who else can say that we live in times that will be spoken about in 100 years from now we are those people uh, we are the authors of the future the pen is in our hands and we can write whatever future we want to see and this is where we are seeing that responsible enterprises uh, advanced organizations are thinking about the future in this positive light how can they shape the future for a better world and jll is uh, the organization that i i work for the real estate real estate company uh, we advise companies on and organizations our client partners in the areas of how do they manage real estate better we manage something like 5 billion square feet of real estate globally and if there's one thing that we have seen all of us in the headlines it's what do we do with the office what do we do with the workplace how do we return to the workplace do we even need a workplace in the future how do we maintain human connection if everyone's working on zoom and these are questions that clients have been asking us they are simple questions but they have deep complicated answers and uh, it's been a very interesting 18 24 odd months uh, i'll give a quick synopsis of uh, what we are hearing from from some of our uh, client partners um, this is uh, susan referenced the great resignation uh, unless you know we've been under rock, rock somewhere for the last 12 odd months each one of us have heard about it um, we are seeing the the top organizations kind of think of this as the great reimagination it's an opportunity to think about uh, what we do why we do it how we do it and think about jobs in terms of skills how do we identify adjacent skills how do we leverage technology ai how do we create human machine partnership because as machines become more machine like it's an opportunity for humans to be more human how do we tap into the full spectrum of capabilities that each one of our organizations has so the jobs to skills discussion is becoming important the other feature is around uh, the human connection piece employees and think of employees as workforce ecosystems so how do you enable people to be productive anywhere how do you tap into new talent models how do you leverage the liquid workforce how do you reach into the human cloud just as we have into the data cloud how do you rearchitect some of these workflows how do you tap uh, you know untapped potential potentially within your within your companies and then the third piece is um, uh, peter you referenced this in your opening remarks change is no longer episodic change is continuous and as change becomes continuous how do we navigate change we are no longer navigating a single change event we are navigating multiple change events that are coming wave after wave so in this sense we are not really managing change we are managing success for people so how do we make people more successful so that's becoming important and we are helping organizations kind of achieve success on that front and then you know we have spoken about flex work flex work environments companies are saying let's flex everything let's be more agile let's be flexible let's leverage liquid networks let's leverage work from anywhere let's leverage smarter portfolios how can you make your workplace smarter how can you make work environments that help individuals teams regenerate things such as you know the workplace could be the opposite of the burnout uh, we've been talking about the workplace being a you know vacation from home for people it's an opportunity for people to connect uh, mentor coach each other uh you know drive some of those social social networks that we have historically leveraged and then the final piece that i would say is there is this massive mindset shift that we are seeing across organizations and you know we have relied on data a lot to make our predictions uh whereas now there is no data uh, we are none of us are pandemic experts we have we have only two years of experience with this we cannot foretell the future based on the two years of pandemic data that we have so how do we learn how do we know what's going to work so we're seeing companies experiment and therefore this test learn adapt mindset is becoming extremely important how do you scenario plan for the future with that 
how do you generate insight from both success and failure how do you use new, new metrics to measure performance because whatever metrics we had in the past uh, don't work anymore and i just conclude by saying that each of the areas that i have spoken about were part of the discussions that we had with our teams at mit i mean some of my cohort were so amazing so you heard susan incredible individual uh, far they could be incredible but we also had folks from nasa department of defense uh, google amazon the the who's who of the world right so we i was very privileged to learn from each one of them uh, and i'll pause there but it's a incredible time we live in extraordinary times like i said we are extraordinary people for living in these times so most more more power to us thank you and i'm pleased that you uh, made that uh, last point about the diversity of people that you are interacting with uh, in our programs at, at MIT from different industries and different geographies, uh, and I'm really curious about that. You know, when when we when any of us look at uh, the decisions that we're hearing that you know large companies, for example, are are, are grappling with and making, and they seem to change uh, you know, and pivot quite a lot as well. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any consistency. You know, I talk to leaders who say, well, you know, we're all about getting everyone uh, back in person in some shape or form. And I talk to other leaders who say we're all about now being completely locationless. You know, your your uh, business really uh, spans uh, so many different I industries. Are you seeing any patterns uh, or is it really you know, all that experimentation is happening and, and, and we really have, have few clues as to what's going to be the new, uh, the new sort of preferred model? I think one of the big patterns that that is emerging, if you will, Peter, is uh, is that people and talent will drive the future, right? So if we if we think about what's happening right now, summed up in three simple sentences, right? Pe people have moved, uh, but organizations have maybe not necessarily reacted as quickly, and there are a variety of reasons for this. There are business complications, constraints. Uh, and challenges. There are historic uh, contractual obligations, et cetera. So those restrict organizations. So organizations are still responding to people who have moved faster. The second piece I would say is that people have moved on, but very few uh, leaders have kept that pace. So we've had some uh, advanced organizations, companies kind of keep pace with what people expect, but people have really moved on uh, much, much more rapid pace. Organizations are catching up. And then I would say that people want to move forward, but many companies are still wanting to return to the past. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. The past is a comfortable place. The future is uncertain and it's difficult. Um, but then if we, want to keep, uh, if we want to keep our competitive advantages in place, we need to move quickly. And Susan referenced uh, some of the historic challenges that companies have had uh, with you know, sticking to the past models. So these three elements are combining kind of to shape the future. And we are also seeing, and you know, it's a great point coming up in in the in the chat there on potential and tapping potential. We will only realize what potential is if we explore. And this is where uh, organizations are saying we have this incredible powerhouse of talent. How do we leverage that? Uh, there is a challenge associated with uh, you know the great resignation, of course. But at the same time, we should not forget those who have stayed back. That right? companies have had people who are staying back. How do we leverage that talent? How do we make them more productive? How do we make them productive agnostic of location? And one of the challenges we are seeing companies deal with right now is how do we create parity of experience? So, you know, simple example, imagine that you are in a meeting room, but your colleague is on Zoom and you're partnering with someone else in that meeting room. Does the colleague on Zoom feel left out? Uh, does he or she have the same kind of experience? How do you bring experience parity across the remote worker, the hybrid worker, the flexible worker, and the in-office worker? So this is a challenge that companies are dealing with right now. And the only way to know what works for you as an organization is by experimenting and finding out. It's like saying that, you know, I buy a suit off the rack. It may not fit me really well. But if I buy something that's tailored to me, it fits me well. So this is where companies are saying one size fits all does not work. Also, Offering flexibility without thinking about what that term means is also challenging. So we've seen companies say, okay, let's try a three days per, per, per week in the office model. But that isn't really flexibility, is it? It's box flexibility. And we've seen employees kind of push back on that as well. Not to say that's an incorrect approach. We just don't know yet. So experiment, find out what works for one team may not work for another. What works for one organization may not work for another. And as we as we have more experience working in this fashion, 
we will we will definitely find that we are productive we have been in the last 18 24 months and we will be in the future as well yeah, that i think that's a, a, a very important point about flexibility and i love how you uh, described that yes we, we do have the the, the risk uh, of inflexible remote working as opposed to you know truly embracing flexibility and empowering our people uh, which i think is what you, know, you and susan were both very much uh, talking about uh, one other thing which uh, Ram, I'm not sure whether you uh, in your business have direct uh, experience so much of, but one of the questions uh, in, in the chat was about, uh, you know, we're not all fortunate enough to live, uh, to work in, uh, in in situations which it's rather easy to use the currently available technology, perhaps to, uh, to, to work more flexibly and more remotely. You know, what about sectors that are more tied to, to, uh, to place? Perhaps you have them in your portfolio. You can think about the healthcare setting, for example, or manufacturing. No, absolutely. And this includes a large part of our business as well. JLL has something like 90,000 odd people globally, Peter. Mm -hmm. And many of those individuals are folks who need to go into the office to maintain space. You can't manage HVAC equipment remotely, right? You can't repair mechanical faults with building equipment remotely. And this is where I think there is a need to think about these forward-looking strategies in an inclusive way. Uh, each, each, each business function requires a different way of thinking as we go forward. And as we blend some of these, so for example, you may have part of a team that is capable of working remotely has access to technology, and you may have a different part of the same team that does not, uh, the workflow or the work processes don't permit that kind of flexibility. So we are seeing this uh, mixture. We are also seeing some, uh, some organizations, for example, let's say, you know, those who are heavily regulated, requiring more physical presence because of regulations. There are some technology features also which compel organizations to work uh, from, from a physical environment. So, you know, we need to consider each one of these from an inclusive perspective, figure out what works, and then uh, create strategies that are inclusive to incorporate all of these different perspectives. Great, thank you. That's, that's again, very thought-provoking and uh, actually leads me to a question which perhaps uh, would be best put to uh, uh, our next panelist, uh, Fuad Dagher. Uh, Fuad, thank you for joining us as well. And uh, Fuad is the Director of Clean Energy Development for, for National Grid. Uh, so you know, now we're moving to a utility uh, company, which you know, perhaps uh, a lot of uh, people's historical views of utilities would that they might not be at the forefront of innovation. Um, but I think in the next few minutes, we're going to hear from Fuad that uh, that's that's not necessarily true. Uh, Fuad, uh, in his role, uh, has really uh, been responsible for, for driving a lot of innovation uh, and change, not only within uh, his, his own company, but uh, as Susan was talking about, ultimately, uh, it's about sort of user and consumer behaviors uh, as well. And so Fuad, I'd, I'd, I'd like to first give you an opportunity to answer the, you know, the same question I put to our other two guests about you know, what are one or two of the things that you've uh, learned, uh, any challenges that you've particularly seen over the last uh, year or two, and how, how you're thinking about that helping you into the future. Uh, but also, uh, perhaps, in a sense, the context for some of what we've been talking about has been you know, COVID uh, and the pandemic, and you know, how, that's been, how that's changed uh, so much for us. Uh, but that comes in the context, of course, of other great challenges, uh, not least of which climate change. Uh, and you know, I'd, I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts on how, the, how these pieces uh, really all uh, need to come together for us in, in, in how we uh, strategize and how we operationalize uh, our need for innovation uh, as, as we go forward. So, uh, Fuad. Thank you, Peter, and hello, everyone across the globe. And thanks to my colleagues, Ram and Susan, for great uh, insights uh, on your on what have you been dealing with the challenge. So as Peter, as you mentioned, um, I work for a utility national grid is an international company uh, focusing on the delivering of gas and electricity to millions of customers around the globe. And then the biggest challenge that we're faced with today is the climate change. And, and climate change is real. We see it every day. We see it in our business. We see it with our customers, how it's impacting them. And for us, we have seen the severity and the frequency of these storms that impact the operation of the gas and the electric grid increasing. 
And so the biggest challenge that we have today is how do we solve, become more resilient, bring cleaner energy and help all of us to, into a cleaner um, energy future. So that requires us to be agile. I believe you asked that question to Susan earlier about how you can agile. We've got to be listening and, uh, and talk about listening to our customers, listening to our communities, listening to our um, friends and neighbors and, and, and businesses we're working with and what it means to them. And it is not the same as somebody mentioned earlier, it's not one size is gonna fit all. So we do have a lot of programs um, at National Grid that's working on creating clean energy environment for our customers, for our communities. And some of these just to, to, to talk about is that the electrification of transportation, for example, moving away from the gasoline engine to a battery powered vehicle, or maybe to a clean hydrogen vehicle, or, or an, another alternative source of fuel. So those are some of the things that we're working about on here. How do we move away from the traditional way of heating and cooling our homes and our businesses into, into cleaner forms of energy? The challenge that we have, and this is something that's personal for me, what I've learned about is for me, about me in here, is that what I've learned here is that change is continuous. It is often, we have no time to prepare for change when it's gonna come and it's gonna come. We have no time to practice. We don't have the plan to plan. You know, change, we're all of a sudden working, working here from my uh, attic <laughs> upstairs, uh, working with, we go outside and wearing the masks and the PPE, the personal protective equipment that we have. So that is a change. Um, but I also found that we are, as people, we are so resilient. We, we bounce back, we, we, um, we come back from difficult situations, from difficult times, and we adapt quickly. Um, our instinct for survivor, survivability, surviving, kicks in very quickly. And so that is something that we're changing here. And then the, the, the thing that I really, uh, and I wanna hear, this is not a commercial or an ad for MIT, but I do say that the class that I took at MIT with Dr. Tara Schwartz about, about um, applied neuroscience, how do you connect the mind and the body together? And how do we start to be a little bit courageous and the stress and, and, and the social uh, factors, how did it impact our, social, our physical abilities? And though having that class in the background, the class that I took at MIT really helped me personally to cope with some of, some of these changes uh, that are happening in the air. Now, um, you know, we, we, I believe you mentioned earlier, I asked around the question about people, not everybody has the ability to, to be remote. People have to be in the office. We are the, we're that entity. National Grid is that entity. We have people who operate the electric grid and the gas network every day, and they've got to be in the control rooms. They've got to be in the field. They've got to be in the, within uh, the communities and the neighborhood. And so we really had to quickly adapt and change and move forward in order to provide the personal protection equipment for our team, the environment, the safe environment for our employees who have to be in the office and be able to uh, provide them all the, the needs that they have. It takes a little bit of um, sacrifice. Some of our, our team members didn't go home for, for days and weeks on end because they had to be in the office so they had to isolate. So we wanted um, to provide the comfort that they need away from home. So we need to be, we were able to change and, and adapt very, very quickly in here. Um, we're resilient. We have to be resilient. Climate change teaches us to be resilient. We need to be resilient. We can't shut down. Matter of fact, we at National Grid look at it and say, we cannot wait for COVID to disappear before we start tackling what we have to tackle from, from climate. Climate is not going to wait for COVID to disappear. It's going to happen. It's going, I mean, today is COVID. Previously, we had other disasters that we have to de dealt with. And then in the future, we don't know what the future is hiding. So we've got to be agile and we have to be moving forward. And that's what we're really trying. The other thing that was the challenge, a lot of the, a lot of the discussion that happens around the water cooler, those are conversations that are real, brings ideas, bounce ideas against each other. 
we don't see those very much happening. So what we at uh, my team, my personal team, what we talked about and start doing, having daily check-ins or every other day check-in, 15, 20 minutes, hey, how are you doing? How's the family? How, away from work, not talking only about work, but talking about the personal lives of people, what matters the most. Working from home, dealing with the children, dealing with elderly people or dealing with my pets or whatever I have. And so that becomes you know, something that we adapt and, and change very quickly on. Um, in, in our world and doing that. But what it does take, it takes the courage. What we really have to, it starts with courage. Do I have the courage to continue? Do I have the trust in my team members and in my teammates? Do I have, am I, am I uh, afraid of conflict? And if we really want to be innovative, we need to be able to have a little bit of conflict with each other with respect, of course, we often enough we see ourselves in artificial harmony, fake harmony, I call it, is that we just agree with somebody just for sake of agreeing. That is not going to deliver us to, to innovation. And I think I think you know, uh, Susan mentioned skepticism is not going to uh, make money. I would say also skepticism and artificial harmony is not going to de deliver innovation. So in addition to not going to deliver money, it's not going to deliver innovation. So how do we move away from that? Um, the biggest thing that we're also looking at is, is that how do we start collecting insights in this environment that we're operating in today? How do we collect insights from our customers? You know, innovation does not happen within the four walls of my office or my building or my home or my business. So we, 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 we really started to look at gathering meaningful insight, listening to the voice of the customers, listening to the voice of our partners and working collectively. And that requires us to be focusing on diversity. You know, we live in communities um, that are diverse. Our workforce is diverse. Um, so how do we start including and engaging with that diverse community of ours? And, 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 um, and I believe also somebody mentioned Steve Jobs. Uh, and I'm here paraphrasing, Steve Jobs said, I, I hire people to work and then I trust that they are going to do what they're smart and doing or something like that to that effect. So that's really what we need to be doing is that we need to listen to the people that we interact with and, and, and include them. Um, everybody brings a voice. And so how do we start listening to these voices and put these ideas together? That's what we're really trying to, to do and do more of. That's great. That, that's very powerful. And you know, I particularly like the way that you put together the uh, this idea of all the different ways that uh, as leaders, we uh, need to uh, develop our empathy muscles, um, but at the same time, retain you know, the ability to challenge uh, ourselves and, and, and each other uh, in order to, uh, to really address the kinds of great challenges that, that, that we're facing. And so thank you for that insight as well as, well as for uh, giving us a little glimpse into uh, what it's been like in, in, in your world in, in National Grid at the moment. You know, one thing which uh, occurred to me that all three of you have sort of uh, touched on in different ways was something about also really understanding who our customers are uh, and making sure that they are part of very much part of our uh, dialogue and our, and our process uh, as well. But I'm wondering for each of you, have, have you seen that change, you know, that uh, particularly over the last 18 months or so that uh, maybe you're not only dealing with the same people as quote unquote customers? I'm going to start with you, Fuad, but I'd love to hear Susan and, uh, uh, and Ram talk about that as well. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Uh, definitely, we are seeing, um, hearing more from our customers. You know, like again, in the energy business, in the energy business that we are in, that I am in, is that our customers are very much in tune with what's going on with the environment and the climate change and, and all uh, the clean energy. And so we have people uh, are asking us for more of uh, clean energy uh, being provided, whether it's clean gas, whether it's clean electricity from renewable sources. Um, the transportation is a huge section uh, sector in our business, in our area. So we're hearing quite a bit from our customers around that and how do we make that real, 
and how do we make that happen? And we are making really, really great progress in that space. In the, I am in, in the New England area. I live in the New England area in Massachusetts. We have also customers in New York and I work in New York as well. And so we're making a lot of changes and working with the state officials, with the government officials, with our customers that are most important. We listen to and, and get insight for and how to bring new clean energy to the customers. Um, and so, yes, the customers are extremely engaged and giving us a lot of feedback and we, and we are doing a lot of listening and we've got to listen um, to our customers and what, to have, what they have to say. Great, thank you. And, and Susan, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. But before I do, I'd also like to uh, make an observation uh, just about how uh, incredible uh, you all three are as panelists, because uh, not only are we having this great conversation, but unprompted, you've dived in to help in the chat as well. I, I, and that's just a fantastic uh, example of of leadership in action but but susan you know th this question of how, cust how our customers are changing and maybe they're not who we thought they were um yes absolutely i i do have a page of notes um and thank you gentlemen i feel so honored um it, it, the thing i want to say to everyone so radius is a startup and so it is very naive to think a customer is the, the ultimate person who is writing the check, as I said earlier, or is the um, person who perhaps is the user. The customers fall into different buckets. And touching on what Fouad said, I want to I want to identify three buckets. So one, we should never stop thinking that our employees are our customers. Because if they do not have a, a joie de vivre, um, this joy of living around, to Ram's point, reimagining the workforce around what it is they're doing, they're not ultimately going to produce a product or service that we're going to feel really good about. So always remember, it's up to you to make sure you, you to, to use this term, and I don't think anyone should be afraid of it, you're constantly wanting to sell your employees. You, you should never forget they're your customers too. The next group of customers are your investors. So in Radius, we did a friends and family round. We raised $7.1 million and uh, one of our investors who's also going to be a new MIT student, Mia is here. And, um, and, and really, as, as long as you have investors, whether you're a publicly traded company or not, um, and if we look at some of the things that have just happened in the news with um, you know, companies not being in integrity or not being transparent, operating in a black box, um, you should never forget your, your customers are you know, also your investors. And one of the things in any startups I advise, I encourage those startups to make sure they are doing monthly communication, having webinars, having open dialogue, and when you start to do that, your investors help to drive both the innovation, the next investment round, and customer acquisition. Then the third group of customers, as I said earlier, are the end users. And I love what Flad said, and I want to do him justice. If you want to be innovative, you can't be afraid of conflict. And so being able to sit in the room and say, listen, I do not have an ego around this. I want honest feedback. Please tell me and then stop talking and start writing, right? Um, sometimes the version, I always tell my staff, version one is better than version none. If your version one can be that thing that really gets the end user excited, um, then you can get the next version out and the next version, the next version. So um, those would be you know, three things I would say in terms of, yes, our customers have changed, but also how we look at who our customers are has changed, especially because of the pandemic that's great and uh and, and ram you also in the chat kind of answered the question but you know as you look at the how you think of who your customer is how, how are you seeing that change i think yeah so i mean firstly i would say echo everything that uh, susan and paul said i for great customer experience put customer second is what i said in the chat um but i would add one piece here and and kind of uh i would say underpins what what susan said as well we are seeing a blurring of boundaries. And by the way, for folks who are interested, fantastic piece from MIT on blurred boundaries. Uh, definitely look it up and read that one. But essentially what we're seeing is that if we if we say customer and salesperson, then we are setting ourselves in for adversarial kind of relationship. 
and we assume it's a zero sum game for me to win someone else has to lose and what we are seeing is that with relationships there is chemistry but there's also alchemy and what i mean by this is it's not a zero sum game both of us can win and what we are seeing to quads point is it's a win 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 we win as individuals we win as a team and we should win as a community and a planet as well so we are seeing this uh, relationship matrix completely change and transform we are seeing uh, a dropping off of adversarial relationships to and a move to more partnerial relationships we are seeing more west partnerships model coming forth and we are therefore seeing that uh, the customer is your partner and not necessarily someone you are selling to that's great and uh, i see that i'm just looking at my clock and see we're going to uh, be coming towards the end of our hour and so maybe i'd like to turn back to each of you on a more personal uh, level as well and we'll stick with you ram for a, for a second uh, you've obviously uh, in, invested a lot in many ways to you know to take a lot of our courses uh, in executive education at, at mit uh, you know how are you thinking about uh, you know your your, your learning uh, journey going in, going into the future. What you know? What are you looking for? What, what are you hoping or needing uh, to 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 add to to your toolkit? I, I would say every opportunity is a learning opportunity, Peter, and uh, every conversation is a learning opportunity. We heard Susan say that as CEO of a company, she is taking notes while others are speaking on this panel, and that that's kind of uh, demonstrative of the mindset that one needs to have as we go forwards. Uh, over the holiday break i i added some more i did some more certifications this is a never never ending journey and the way i look at this is that learning is a great gift it's a it's the only treasure that follows its owner till the end and um i i don't think there can be a greater gift than learning so um, i i wouldn't ever stop because we don't know what the future holds there's just so much that's coming our way uh, there's so much great content out there uh, i wish each one of us lived many lifetimes in parallel that we could learn all of these things uh, we had uh, an incredible speaker by the name of vivian ming come and join us as part of one of the sessions we had at mit and she actually said that each one of us live something like uh, 11 lifetimes through our through our lives each lifetime is an opportunity to master a new skill to live a different uh, to live a different life almost and i therefore see that it's uh, it's a continuous learning opportunity for us and learning makes us uh, be better individuals uh, uh, and you know allows us to uh, equips us with the tools necessary to navigate the future great thank you and 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 how about you for what what do you see as some of the things that uh, you know that you want to keep learning or or or, or new skills and tools that uh, that that you hope to be uh, building so in the future I'm sorry. You're gonna see me going back to MIT. You're, you're gonna see me signing up for one of, or two more classes, hopefully soon. Uh, I've been looking actually at the course catalogs. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 learning is like change. It's continuous. I mean, I don't see myself or my I'm hoping my team and people I interact, my kids as well, to stop learning because without that learning is that we, we, there's no plateau for learning. You cannot just this is a continuous uh, um, curve going up. But I also realize is that what's got us to where we are now is not going to get us where we need to be in the future. And without that learning and without that continuous learning and continuous and changing, we're, we, 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 we can't get to the future. So that's what's my goal into, into the future for learning. Great, thank you. Uh, very well said. And, uh, and Susan, uh, perhaps the last few words to you uh, on, on this topic. You know, what, what are you most excited about uh, learning in the, uh, in the future? So much. Um, growing up, my dad was a single dad. And so he I started with a dad story. I'll, I'll close with one as well. So he would always say to me, what did you learn today? And Ram and Fouad, my dad is um, 82 and I'm turning 50 this year. And when we speak, he always says, what did you learn today? So he puts me in the hot seat. So it's a lifelong of learning, lifelong endeavor of learning. Um, I'll, I'll finish with a story. 
Wayne Dyer, the great business philosopher, some of you may know who he is. I had the, the privilege of speaking with him on stage the last time he spoke live. And he and Zig Ziglar, another great business philosopher, they were best friends and they had an ongoing battle. And Zig used to say, it's motivation that makes a great entrepreneur. And, um, and Jim would say, it's education. And so one day, finally, Jim called up Zig and he said this. He said, if it was just motivation without education, you'd end up with a bunch of motivated idiots. <laughs> and so the, the big thing I want to close with is um, whether we fail calculus in university or my friend Glenn Stearns, um, billionaire, failed. Um, he was the first undercover billionaire on Discovery. He failed grade four. I don't want any of you to ever let your past failures dictate your future results. We're all human, we all have flaws, myself included. The more we learn and we have that, that attitude of learning, especially from others, the better everyone is going to be. Everyone in your community, your family, and this planet. So to celebrate my 50th, I am going to finish my ACE. And then I am also applying for my MBA at MIT, which again, the calculus, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Ram, I'm calling you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's how I'm going to celebrate. But I just want to wish you all a beautiful 2022. If you had a question you didn't get answered, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. We'd be more than happy to be of service. So thank you, Peter, for hosting. Well, thank you. And what an inspiring note to end on. Uh, it really remains for me to once again, thank you, Susan Sly, Ram, uh, Srini Vasan, uh, and Fouad Daga. You have been absolutely uh, incredible panelists great response uh, from, from our audience today as well. And I know there are a lot of questions, so you may well get people uh, reaching out to you or perhaps seeing you in programs uh, and asking you uh, in person. Thank you all uh, for joining us. It's been tremendous to see you. Uh, we know uh, that this year uh, is going to continue to be a challenging uh, one, uh, but these are, you know, as great as these challenges are, as all of our panelists, I think, have illustrated, uh, it's within our power uh, to both be resilient, but also uh, make sure that we and our organizations uh, and the communities that we're part of uh, all uh, are able to respond to uh, these challenges and to thrive. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, please keep uh, a look on our, our website or your inbox for information uh, about forthcoming uh, webinars and LinkedIn Live events from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, but on that note, with final thanks once again uh, to our three panelists and to all of you, uh, it's goodbye from MIT. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. <laughs>